You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. And thank you for another summer themed episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And we're joined by friend and wine guru yet again, Mr. Eli Ross. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Bob and Jim. Great to be here. Yep. And uh, this is, as Jim from last month, this is Patio Pounders Part Du because of the overwhelming success and <laughs> feedback we've had on the show. And there's so many great patio pounders out there. We're, just gonna, we're probably going to have to do part trois as well, <laughs> get through the rest of these. Even in the wintertime, we'll be still doing patio <laughs> pounders. But uh, yeah, we got four great ones here tonight that are strictly in that budget range and mm. that would look good on the picnic table, look good outside, instead of the old generic names like, you know, uh, barefooted, bubbly, and all that other stuff. You know, you're going to try some interesting things with us tonight and hopefully like. So. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let's jump right into it, Eli. All right. So the first one uh, that, that I picked out is this uh, Muga Rosé. I think it's a 2013. Um, you know, you may see different vintages out there. Frankly, it's probably not a lot of difference vintage to vintage in this, but let's go ahead and give it a pull here. That is certainly a big bouquet on this one. Very mild. Yeah, I mean, you get some of the uh, kind of peach, apricot, um, so it's not overly, you know, in-your-face fruity. It is, it's pretty restrained. No, but it's, yeah. it's great acidity with this. There's, yeah. there's such a strong citrus finish to this, kind of a tart finish, yep. uh, which is unusual for rosés. You know, a lot of rosés tend to be very bland. Right. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is uh, yeah, definitely it's not flabby or anything. And this would go great with, um, you know, shellfish or anything that, um, or even some kind of, you know, if you had appetizer that had a little more um, fat or something, cream. Cream soup, not that that's a patio. Yeah, there's still yeah. that flavor <laughs> yeah. in my mouth. Now, we had um, deviled eggs at right. our last wine party last week, that, and it's yeah. yeah. oh, a that's tough right. pair. This would have been really interesting. Yeah. Uh, they were good deviled eggs, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Wait, was that your recipe or was that Beth's? That was Beth's. Oh, yeah. Beth, this is for you. <laughs> they were phenomenal. I think we ate a little too many of those deviled eggs, actually. There weren't many left at the end of the night. Well, you know, when you make a dozen, you got to eat them all. So. <laughs> is there any history on this one, Eli, that we should know about? Um, so this, so Muga is uh, is pretty. They are pretty well established in uh, Rioja, which is probably the most famous um, wine region in Spain. And um, this, uh, so so they do a full range. They do rosé, but their bread and butter is kind of the classic big red wines that are very tannic and kind of. Um, so, but this is kind of their entry point for uh, for this style of, of wine. And uh, actually, had the opportunity to visit them a couple years ago. And the interesting thing that they do is is uh, they even do their own barrels. So you walk through the winery and there's guys making the barrels, toasting them, mm. the whole nine. So it's like, it's total, you know, vertical integration, old old world style. Um, so these they, they would be considered definitely an old school type producer in, mm. in that region, which is, I think when we get later on in the Italian, we'll talk about, you know, new versus old. And, and this is more of a, you know, this is definitely in that kind of conservative um, Spanish style, but it's great wine and great price. How would you wine. compare that, Jim, with the last week's uh, rosé that we were? Uh, the last week, last month, we had the Minuti, and uh, Minuti is a little milder than this. Mm -hmm. uh, this this has a, you know, like I said earlier, much more acidic kind of citrus kick to it at the end, uh, which I'm really enjoying. Um, I've been drinking a lot of the Minuti lately, though, and that's that was my go-to rosé for the summer. Uh, but this just might usurp it. Is that what? Italian? Or? It's uh, Provence, France. Okay. Which is funny because the summer is still going strong when you're watching this episode. So our experience with rosés is going to continue throughout viewing this show and off probably into the next couple months. So we might have different I, opinions. I'm going to be at a rosé tasting tomorrow night. Wow. So I will have a whole collage to go through for our next <laughs> oh, show. That is a rosé tasting yeah. up in Boston. All rosés. Oh, sweet mama. So I'm going to miss that one. <laughs> so what's the price point on this, Eli? 
Uh, I think it's you know ten fifteen dollars, um, depending on where you buy it. A lot of places will even have it already chilled, which is nice. Just grab it and go. So available in most local distributors. Uh, yep, or? yep, yeah. I've seen it in several places in in the local area. So well, let's give this a rating before it here. So because I love rosés and I've really yet to have a really bad one this summer, I'm going to give this one definitely a thumbs up. Definitely thumbs up as well. Love it. I, since I brought it, I guess I have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this it's is one. I, I, yeah, I, like I, it'll be interesting to see what you think of. It. I've never been to an actual tasting of all rosé, so I, you know, at some point, yeah, you you may have a really good reference point for some of these differences. Yeah. But but this is one that I found and just latched onto as a good summertime go-to. Well, just to let you know, Bob has brought a couple of stinkers on the show in the past. So we've, oh, we yeah, have, have brought, bad brought something and then said, you know, thumbs yeah. down. So okay. it's, it, it don't does be afraid happen. To... Yeah, it does. Unfortunately, no Jim, I, I can't one. remember what those stinkers <laughs> were. But, uh... Short memory. Yeah. <laughs> but it's summer. As you guys know, Jim and I love our Sauvignon Blancs. Um, I've had this one that's coming up. We're going to be tasting next a couple times. It's a great California Napa one. Um, it's Project Paso 2010 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's from the Paso Robles Wine District. And I think, Eli, you said you noticed before, it's a Don Sebastiani and Sons of Napa creation. And I love this one. It's really easy to drink. It's also really easy on the palate, depending on what you're having for a uh, cookout on the outside. Once again, this is also available any place locally if you do a little research. And this is all Sauvignon Blanc? It's not a blend? This should be 100%. All right. Now, it's interesting because the, the nose is supposed to be very lemony on this one. So. I don't get the lemony, but they say the nose is very lemony. I, I get and, that. And you know, the color is very dark for a Sauvignon Blanc, too. This, yeah. this is almost, it's almost reminiscent green. of a Chardonnay. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're getting that kind of very uh, very deep gold color. That's why wine tasting is so fantastic, because I don't actually smell the lemon in this at all. And a very thick body, too. This this is one of those wines, you know, if, if I was blind tasting it, I would, I would guess Chardonnay mm -hmm. rather than Sauvignon Blanc. It's... It, it's interesting because they do say it's a full-bodied mm -hmm. yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I don't think it's buttery, but it's definitely a full-bodied mm -hmm. Sauvignon Blanc. I don't quite get the cantaloupe or the grapefruit that you generally would get in a Sauvignon Blanc, but I don't think there's a problem with that. It's just I don't get that burst of flavor that you normally would. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's a big, it, it's interesting to go from the Muga to this because, yeah, the acidity profile is very different. This is much lower, as we were just talking about, which which I, don't, I, I wonder if we'd had that first. Maybe it wouldn't be, in my mind, palate wouldn't be so stark. Yeah. But, I think you well, definitely try cracker. <laughs> <laughs> Cleanse the palate. Well, you know, I just use the wine for that. I, I, I took a sip and I'm smelling it now, and I, I can sort of maybe smell a little bit of lemon now. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, the whole purpose of this show, these summer shows, is these are the kind of wines that would complement a lot of summer fare, whether it's a salad, whether it's blue cheese, whether it's chicken. Um, this is the kind of stuff that pairs really well with that kind of fare. Yeah. And I know you're a great cook, Jim, and don't let him be modest, but you cooked some great <laughs> stuff this weekend, <laughs> last weekend, and we. Had quite a lot of wine with those. So, what was actually? What did you make that beef? That was a beef tenderloin, right? It was a beef tenderloin. I did a, just a little dry rub on top, and then threw it on the grill for a little while. And, and I think we paired that with. We had eight bottles that night. So. <laughs> oh God! No, don't worry. No, I think it was only seven people. Please. Um, but I, I think we started off with the rosé. We did a couple of rosés, um, but with yeah. You know, by the time we got to the beef, we were drinking red. Yeah, we were. So. And I unfortunately can't remember what that red was. That doesn't look good for us. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this is, uh, I've had this a couple times, and this is a great go-to, especially, like I said, you'd always, I'm sure you the same way you like, you don't always want to have the same fare. You don't want to pull out the expensive stuff when you're outside and you're having a picnic or a par party in the backyard, but you want to have something that's not the standard fare, like Kendall Jackson, Barefoot and Bubbly. And these are, the, these are just a little bit higher than that price point, mm -hmm. which tastes better and look better. I'd right, that, that extra okay. four or five dollars, is it's a, it's a big, huge, it's a big sure. step Sure, it up, does make right? a big difference. Yeah. 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 Right. And, yeah, they talk about the sweet spot in the wine world being you know, between nine and thirteen dollars, and if you know the, the, the higher you skew in that price range, obviously the better quality you're going to get. Um, and that's the price point for the first two, yeah, roughly, mm -hmm. yeah, between yeah. nine, fourteen, fifteen dollars, and uh, I think you get a, a lot more character in both these, both the rosé and the. the one thing we didn't talk about, but I guess maybe I don't. Do you know is this one? I assume you drink this pretty. It's not one you're going to sit down for a while and age, right? It's that's a good point. Uh, for whites, Jim, you don't generally eat the No, typically those, those are meant to be consumed almost immediately. Um, I, I would drink this right away. Uh, you know, the, most of the wines you're going to find in a wine store are meant to be consumed in the next two or three years anyway. I mean, you're, Eli, you're buying 
higher end stuff. So you're you know, you're definitely cellaring your wines for quite a while. But <laughs> or, or yeah, or sometimes being too impatient. And, uh, <laughs> I think last time I was here, we hit we hit a few of those that were a little too young. But yeah, well, actually, that was the uh, Chateau Montalena. Right, show. the old versus new. Old versus new, and yeah. there was a distinct difference between both. They were yeah. both delicious, um, but uh, there was a definite flavor profile. And did you roll out an aerator for those? Uh, I don't know what we did. Yeah, I think I think I had del- I had done some sort of fancy double decanting, which I got a lot of grief about. <laughs> so. But this, it's funny now that I've tasted this a little bit more. I am getting the acidity is sort of coming back. It's just mm-hmm. be, I think it was coming off the movie, which is just so. Uh, uh, so tart, but I and again, we all liked it, but it's, it is, it, this is nice. All right, so uh, another thumbs up, at least for me. I'm biased because I've had it before, so I'm, I'm going to keep uh, the thumbs up going. I'm giving it a half thumb just because it's not what I traditionally expect out of a Sauvignon Blanc. Absolutely fair. Yeah, I'm going to go with Jim, just kind of say, I mean, it, it's a good it's a good wine. I think it's well made, um, but but yeah, I kind of give it a little a few points down just from the standpoint of, you know, it's, it, I wouldn't necessarily peg it as a Sauvignon Blanc. You know, you're right, only because if you have real Sauvignon Blanc fans and you're in your backyard right. or picnic, they're going to taste that really quickly and say, this is a Sauvignon Blanc. Right. So yeah, I mean, you have certain people that I think one of our friends is that way, right? It's just all she drinks is Sauvignon Blanc, and you gave someone like this, and they'd be, oh, you know, they might yeah. warm up yeah. on it, but it's, yeah. it is different. So, All right, so we're going to move into a red now, and uh, it's one of mine, and I think Eli's had it before. It's a Monte Etico 2009 Toscana. It's a blend. It's an 85% uh, Sangiovese. 10% Cabernet Sauvignon and a 5% Merlot. And um, as Eli can clarify or Jim can clarify, it's not your typical Italian wine. It's considered a super Tuscan um, because it's not the grape varietal is not 100% Italian. And so when I think when you have a combination of different grape varietals, that's where the super Tuscan name comes from, I believe. Well, I think you know, Jim, you know, chime in as well. But I, in different places, and you know, particularly in Europe, it was they were more strict, so they would yeah. create designations where. They sort of out of people get together, winemakers, and and say, hey, you know, let's just make our own. That way, we aren't stuck to these more rigid, you know, in Tuscany, it must be all, you know, Sangiovese, and mm-hmm. and in Piedmont, it must be all Nebbiolo, and, and so this gives a little more freedom. Um, and I think the other thing is that they were really trying to compete with some of the big wines in, in Bordeaux and France, you know, and and bringing in some of these big Cab and Merlot along with the native uh, or you know local grapes so right that's the problem you know a lot of these european winemakers get locked into growing one specific varietal is you know they mm-hmm. their flavor profile is very slim and if yeah if they're competing on a global stage right. against these huge cabs and and pinot noirs from california they they have to do something like this and create you know this marketing title super right. tuscan uh, just to be able to compete well, on the California stage. did the same thing. There's wines they call uh, merit, Meritage or Meritage, depending mm-hmm. on how you want to pronounce oh, it. Yeah, but those sure. are sort of their attempt at saying, well, you know, we're just going to, it's a blend, right? I can kind of have more free form. Because even in the U.S., there's rules about the percentage, right? I think if it's more than, if it's less than 75% of a given grape, it has it can't be called, for example, it can't be called Cab. It would have to be, you know, yeah. a red blend or something like that. So. Yeah, I was surprised that our government actually interferes with wine marketing like that, too. But uh, the same thing happened with White Zinfandel. You know, Behringer's rolled out White Zinfandel, and they were, you know, they're just trying to make a rosé wine. Right. Um, and the it was actually the Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms that came back and said, hey, you've got to put the varietal on here. And so that's why they, they came up with the marketing term White Zinfandel. Hmm. And we've been paying the price ever since. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those and, wines do not age well. But. I guess, no. <laughs> speaking of paying the price, you will notice that Eli, being the guest, has the biggest glass that he's drinking his red out. He brought his own. And my, my pour, I think, is about equivalent, so it's not good, at least for now. Nice nose. I love the nose, and, I, and I'm not usually a big Sangiovese fan, but... This is it's one of the few times that I, I'm going to say that the tasting notes are exactly what you feel. It is a very soft intensity red, mm-hmm. which is what sort of you might want if you're outside mm-hmm. and eating. But it's got a great smooth finish. You know, yep. the, the problem I have with a lot of Sangiovese is they just drop off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's so much tannin at the end. And this is so smooth. And I think it's, it's the it's cab the blending, in the right? blend. Yeah. It's just smoothing this thing out. It's really a delicious wine. What's great about this particular Italian is you, know, you have a combination of two great uh, Italian wine guys. You have, uh, I think you might be familiar with Neil Epstein. He's a very desirable uh, wine importer, has a great portfolio on Italian wines, and a uh, renowned enologist. Is that the right word? Enologist uh, for a wine? Enology. Yeah, close enough. Close yeah. enough, yeah. <laughs> Franco Bernabe. And uh, he's been around making wine for a long time. And this is sort of their creation. I think uh, it's a great concoction of an easy to drink summer wine. 
Yeah, and I think that's, it's funny you mention that because that's one of the things too when you talk about modern wine is that there are literally people that travel the world as consultant mm -hmm. enologists or whatever, you know, basically wine making experts and they, they would come to Jim's winery for a day and say, oh, well, if you just blend this and blend this and they put their name on it and boom, yeah. there you go. So. And what's fascinating is they can taste the wine in its infancy right. before it's even aged properly and they can, you know, they can do a barrel tasting and say, okay, we need to add a little more of this or a little more of this. And, it's you know when you drink the finished product, you know you, it's very easy to tell. Okay, what am, what am I tasting here? But when you're drinking it in its infancy before it's aged, it, I, that's a whole different yeah. skill set. And I think I mean you could poke at the marketing of it, but I think at the end we the consumer benefits right because it mm -hmm. raises the quality level of, of everything to have people. That's, uh, that's part of the reason why they're calling this the golden age of wine. Is mm -hmm. there there's so many great winemakers out there and they're traveling all over the world sharing their knowledge. And there are so many great wines you can buy under. Fifteen dollars, right. whereas you know, twenty, thirty years ago, you had to pay fifty, sixty dollars a bottle to get something this good. And I can't underestimate the fact that we're doing summer shows. These next couple of shows with the past show, these are really easy to drink wines. Even this red. Some people think I can't drink a red in the summertime. Well, I'll tell you, you can drink this, this red in the summertime. Absolutely. Now, what mean, do you think you'd pair with this as far as food? This is definitely uh, ribs. This is a burger. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of a lighter meat fare. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not poultry. I don't think poultry obviously. I think is you could go pull salmon off with this if you want. Yeah, you, you could. could probably because it's got that away. fattiness in mm -hmm. the salmon or even a tuna mm -hmm. steak type thing. I, I would say anything off the grill. You know, this has a nice little smoky nose yeah. to it, yeah, the, which I think will complement something coming off the grill. And I think 2009, Eli, I might clarify this, was a great year for Tuscan wines mm -hmm. in general, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, so this definitely is a is a is one to seek out if you're chasing that particular year. And all this is available locally. Do some research, and once again, the price point is between ten and fifteen dollars for this uh, locally. But uh, wow, that's that's delicious, fantastic. I'm I'm not I'm not finished yet, but I'm gonna have some more of this later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your experience with Italian wines? Do you add that to your portfolio a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're um, they're great food wines, right? As we just talked about, they're, which they should be. They're very mm -hmm. versatile, right? And uh, um, yeah, and, and there's a wide range of price points. They don't tend to be even in the sort of the collecting end, the higher, a little bit higher price point. They're not as over overblown or the, the price escalation, right? Isn't like in Napa or Bordeaux or these yeah. other places. So you can still find some really great wines, um, world class stuff that'll age for twenty or thirty years, you know, at, at reasonable prices. So. Well, I'm very excited about our next one. Okay. All right. What do we got? So last but not least, um, kind of coming back full circle, this is another Spanish um, red from actually the same, if not the same town, basically the you know suburb of the same area in the northern part of Rio, uh, Rioja. So it's called uh, Lopez de Haro. Um, and uh, the Crianza, I think, means that it was aged in oak for a year. So Rioja is one of those places where um, typically, they would sit on the wine and age it for, you know, some of them are up to three, four, five years on oak before they release it. So, so at the Grand Reserva, you don't even see that until, you know, five, six years out of the vintage. So this is kind of like the entry level, um, which is amazing to get this for 10 or $15. I'm assuming that it's halfway And it's a 91 so. pointer from what I see on the label. Yes, they, right, another speed of marketing, right? They, <laughs> so you have not tried this I yet. have not had this, no. no. Oh, we, we're in virgin territory here. Yeah. I like that. Yep. Yeah. And I wasn't swayed by the uh, the 91 points. I noticed that later, but uh, that is a really dark, dark red. Well, I've noticed that any time a wine gets over 90 points for a rating, the price tends, tends to just skyrocket. And you know, sometimes you you can taste the wine before it gets rated, and let's say it's a $10 wine. After the rating comes out, you know, it jumps yeah, 15, I mean, 20 bucks. I think it's interesting. It's you know, you talked about the golden age of wine. I think the golden age of wine reviewing is sort of past mm -hmm. because you have what you could call like the Yelpification of wine reviews. Good you point. can go online and you can find, you know, us three, like a lot of my other friends that are really into wine, they'll write have all their own blogs too. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah true. so I mean, I, I think you're right in the past, like a big rating would really drive uh, the price, but, but now it's almost like, you know, and especially as we talked about before, the quality level is so high that if you know what you're doing, you should be able to make a 90 point wine with the right terroir and the right ingredients. Right. So, so yeah, this is, this is, you know, a little darker than the, uh, the Monte Antico. Um, so I think as, as I didn't maybe didn't say this, but it's, this is primarily Tempranillo, which is the the, uh, the major grape. Um, it's very mild that, that they use in uh, in Rioja. There is so much fruit in this mm. compared to the last one. Wow. 
Yeah, this definitely. Um, I was. I don't think we. I don't know what, if you said about the aging for the uh, for the Italian one, but maybe what five years. Or yeah, I think 2016 like is about the max if yeah. you find that particular year. Yeah, I think um, this this would probably probably about the same. Probably maybe maybe longer if you stored it right. But yeah, this has the nose on this is a little earthier. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little more, you know funky if that's kind of where you want to describe it but um. well I got to say I'm a little jealous that you have the bigger glass to get your nose really <laughs> in there right now because this is one that you need a little bit of more experimentation mm -hmm, yeah. with I sort of uh, maybe after the show I'm going to be spending some time with this particular one because I'll let you smell my glass yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is really good this is really really good and smooth yeah. another S classic example of tonight's episode about having stuff that's easy to drink as a red people always mm -hmm. get worried about drinking red wine in the summertime you can't get worried about this one there are a little tannins in this mm -hmm. at the very end, uh, especially in comparison with the last one. But again, it's you know when you think of red wine and a lot of tannin, it's it's not something you want to drink during the summertime. But this is, I think would be another good summertime red. Yeah, slightly chilled. I think yeah. with the uh, you know maybe with this you'd want you know maybe something um, um, you know big steak or you know something that has a. a when the sun's steak. going down and you're doing the grilling in the evening, maybe instead of sitting yeah. out in the sun, yeah. this is the perfect bottle. To, uh, save to this one for the sunset. I think maybe okay. save this one for the sunset. Yeah, don't waste this on the sangria. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you just found this particular one as uh, you were doing some research before coming on the show tonight? Or? I literally just walked into the package store. And, and so, I again, I, I recognize the name Haro because it's the same town that this place, Muga, which links back to the first one. So that was kind of, I just caught my eye and I said, hey, you know, at this price point, um, and it, it is a testament to, I think the guy is only like 35 that runs this. He has a PhD in viticulture or something. You know, again, sounds like a great gig. But, but yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a testament to to the to this golden age that we live in, and you know, we're we're all the better for it. So. And Jim, I got to ask you also, like uh, you know, you're in high culture up there in Boston. You know, you go to a lot of these wine tastings. Uh, have you found that a lot of what they're drinking up there is different than what we're drinking back here, or is it in the same category? Uh, they're drinking a lot of the same types of wines. Um, they obviously, because every state has its own different liquor laws, they're drinking different vintages or different bottles than, than we're getting here. They have here. that big poppy wine. Uh, yeah, that's up there. That's a huge Classic, seller, yeah. especially during the baseball season. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's the different wines are available in different states, and so I, you know, the, the Minuti that I brought last month, for example, uh, you can't buy that here in Connecticut, unfortunately. So I, you know, I'm I'm going to be bringing some great wines onto this show, and hopefully, uh, people can get those via mail order if they can't get them here locally, or just drive right over the border, or go over the border. And not that we're advocating, not know, that we're advocating violating your interstate trade or something like but that. But yeah, That's Massachusetts true. has uh, no sales tax on beer and wine or liquor, which is a good thing. So. But yeah, this, it's funny, I mean, I don't know if you guys are getting this, but in this bigger glass, the, it is opening up a little bit more, the nose is coming out, so. Which this is another example of, even in a, a, a wine at this price point, you can still get really complex wines that are delicious. And that's really what's changed over, you know, mm -hmm. all these years, is you can get some really good wine that is both complex and delicious. And uh, you would not be ashamed to serve that to anybody. Yeah, I think this one, as, as Jim alluded to, it's got a little tannin, so maybe even this is one if you bought a case and hang on to two or three bottles for a few years, you wouldn't be, uh, I don't think you'd be disappointed. No. So. You're obviously not. So what's the, what do we get? I give this a thumbs oh, up. Oh, that's, a, that's a, a thumbs huge up, yes. thumbs up. Huge thumbs yeah. up. And once again, I, I said that's one of those that you sort of want to experiment with a little. You know, you, you have a nice regular red, red wine glass like that and uh, stick your nose in there and swirl it around and... Uh, talk wine trivia and talk and <laughs> come across as a wine nut after the show, of course. But uh, yeah, that's, that's phenomenal. I appreciate you bringing that in tonight. That was really delicious. Yeah, I lo it, was, it was a good, like I said, I had never had it either. So it now, do you typically time. do that? Do you walk into a wine store and just buy something sight unseen or it's something you haven't tasted before? Yeah, I think now, I mean, I, the, the certain, the regions uh, usually is the first thing I gravitate towards. So whether it's you know northern Italy or this part of Spain, and then then I just kind of look you know I might look at the label a little bit. But yeah, I don't. Um, I you know I find that just the, the, that's the great thing is that the, your odds now of getting a winner are much higher. Mm -hmm. So the the research, you know, if if you're going to spend seventy dollars on a bottle of wine, yeah, you still got to do that. But at ten, at ten fifteen dollars, even if you hate it, okay, so <laughs> you learned yeah. something, right? So. I've I've just always had a rule. I I don't typically buy wine unless I try it in a wine it, right. tasting, yeah. but uh, there are fewer wine tastings in Boston than here in Connecticut, so I've been doing a lot more of the just, okay, mm -hmm. that looks good, I'll, I'll give it a shot. The overhead's a little higher for the, uh, their wine tasting. Yeah, probably their wine yeah tasting. I mean, I kind of treat the first mm -hmm. bottle as the tasting, and then if I like this one, I would probably go back and get mm -hmm. a case, right, and, and or two just to yeah. have, it, have it around, so. 
You said you're doing a rosé tasting this weekend? Tomorrow night. Is there a vintage or varietal that's uh, composing the tasting? Is it all? Well, it's uh, it's a group of 20 people, and everybody's bringing their own bottle. So we're going to see what people show okay, up so with. It's not a, it's a not professionally uh, no. organized. Or no, whatever, this so. is just a it's a, something on Meetup.com. So interesting. Yeah. Now wait a minute, I got to ask. Everybody's bringing their own bottle. It's a group of 20 yeah. people. Yeah. That's a lot of rosé. Yeah. Where is Bobby P in this whole scenario? <laughs> I, where where is Bobby P? You should have come up this weekend <laughs> instead of last weekend. That's what's great about where you live, because you go to these tastings. You don't have to drive anywhere. You get a cab or yeah. you walk. Yeah, take yeah, the train. That's where we're lacking here. It's uh, yeah, I always got to drive somewhere. You can take the magic bus to New Britain. <laughs> uh, that's for another show. Okay. I, I try to keep the politics out of it, but uh, yeah, that, that magic bus, yeah, that is. But you know, Eli, I will say, I know Eli's using a Rito glass tonight, and um, I know we've used Rito glasses before. We, and I, I guarantee you that probably tastes better in that. Absolutely, yeah. We did a, a whole show on, on the difference between regular glasses and Riedel's. And you know, the Riedel is designed to really open the wine up uh, and get it on the right spot on your tongue. So you, you and I, Bob, are getting a completely different experience than you. Yeah, and I haven't, I, mean, I haven't had all the different Riedel varietally matched. But I think that right, the, the bigger thing is just like it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when you go to a restaurant and you order a decent bottle of wine. And no offense, but if they give you a glass like this, it's right. like, hey, guys. Yeah. Right? So, so just having a, a bigger bowl to let you kind of get those aromatics and enjoy it. You know, that actually is a great question. We know that there's a lot of great BYOB places around which sometimes you may not want to use, but what about if you just want to bring your own glasses to a mm -hmm. restaurant? What's the procedure for that if you found? I mean, it, it definitely pegs you as kind of a dork, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> um, but you've done, you done that? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think so. I mean, it, it's, uh, no, it's, it's a definitely a plus of a place, particularly if it's a BYOB or a, a corkage cork friendly place, um, if they have good glassware and they keep it coming. I think, like, uh, I mean, if I can mention names, I would say Grants is a place. Oh, it's yeah, definitely, absolutely. Mention them. They'll definitely do that. If you if you pay the what, 20 bucks or whatever it is yeah. to bring your own wine, they're, they don't, they're don't. they not bringing you the you know chintzy little uh, cheap glasses. So. Yeah, in our remaining two minutes, that's one of the things that I think we should talk about because, you know, we always talk about BYOB places. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, is it, can you have BYOB in Boston? Not in Boston. No, it's, it's not legal there. Hmm. But uh, we've, you've got a bunch of favorites here, and we've gone to uh, the Pond House Cafe quite a few times. Uh, yeah, that's Elephant true. Trail. There's a couple of Thai uh, places in town, both here yeah. in West Hartford now and still in uh, the Gavon Elephant Trail. Um, there's another one. Is it Hot Basil on, uh, on that yep. side? What? That would yep. be, I just had a show idea, if you haven't already done it, would be to do BYOB wines, right, that would go with those different. Because one of the things, like with a Thai place, is that actually, frankly, nothing we brought here would really no. go with what you'd, you'd, want, you'd want a Riesling. Riesling, right, exactly, a little sweeter. So, so I, I think you might be able to pair the rosé. Depends what you ordered, yeah. yeah. I like very spicy Thai food, so I, I think you could still drink either one of those. Well, I think ones. that maybe with like a coconut, like a more of a curry, creamy type thing, maybe you could pull that off. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm a fan of, I live, we live on the other side of the river, Pazzo, um, oh, yeah. over yeah. in uh, Glastonbury is kind of a, a classic uh, BYO place. That, didn't, I thought they changed. I, thought I think, yeah, they, they got a liquor, like, which happens a lot. Places eventually get their liquor license, and then they sort of relented and said, well, you yeah. can still do it. You know, same sort of thing. You can still bring it's your Grandfather you in. Right. Do they still charge that corkage fee? But, yeah, it's like three or five bucks. It's not. Okay, that so. changes things, people. I just was told something that I was not aware of. So Pazzo has changed. Bobby P is going to be back out the Pazzo's. <laughs> <laughs> Critiquing the food. Now, if I'm so wrong far, on so. that, I, <laughs> I'm, 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 I make no warranty for my. Uh, so. I well, just want to remind yes. everybody uh, you can view previous episodes of our show on whctv.org or on youtube.com. And if you have a question or comment for the show, please uh, friend us on Facebook and send us a message that way, and we'll try and answer it on the show. Absolutely. It's great to have Jim back. Eli, it was great to have you back on the show. My pleasure. And uh, as always, have an enjoyable summer and keep all three of us in, in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.